All right, so you actually don't have these slides on Archaea, I don't believe, in your packet, do you? You just have bacteria. Uh, we added these in since then. You can just listen. You don't have to write, write these down. We've already talked about, like, the general characteristics of Archaea. Just talk about a, a few more um, details here for a minute. So as you know, Archaea, and uh, they have their own domain. Okay? We call it Archaea, and they're in their own kingdom. And Archaea are single cell. They're prokaryotes, so they don't have a nucleus. They don't have other organelles. And that's really prokaryote, we kind of say it means they don't have a nucleus, but it really also means they don't have other membrane-bound organelles. They don't have chloroplasts in them. They don't have mitochondria. Okay? So they're a simpler cell in terms of their complexity. Archaea um, can be autotrophic. And in fact, some of them have a uh, sort of unique form of, of being autotrophic. Now, when we talk about autotrophs, we're usually talking about plants and other organisms that can make their own um, food using photosynthesis, which requires sunlight. But there are some other forms of making their own, an organism's food that don't require sunlight, that uses different chemicals. Okay? Um, for example, some organisms that live in deep sea vents, you know, very, very deep in the ocean, where gases from inside the earth are being vented, some organisms have adapted to use sulfur and other chemicals from those vents and use that to make their own food. That's their source of energy rather than sunlight. And so um, archaea are one of those organisms that um, have that chemosynthesis. They reproduce asexually through a process called binary fission. And we're going to talk about binary fission later on with protists. And Binary fission means basically they just split in two. They copy their genetic material and then split in two and form two new cells. Okay, so the DNA copies, the cytoplasm divides, and then we have two organisms when we started with one. And so many archaea are what are called extremophiles. They live in extreme conditions. Here's some examples of where scientists have found some of these organisms living. Okay. The thermophiles are able to survive in extremes of temperature, okay, very high temperatures. Um, okay. They can survive in conditions which most other organisms would not be able to tolerate. Some survive in very acidic conditions, pH of below 3 which is very acidic, the acidophiles. Xerophiles live without water. Halophiles can live in extreme salt concentration. So these are all sort of unique situations that these organisms can survive in. And scientists believe that it's possible these archaea are some of the oldest organisms on Earth that as the Earth formed four and a half billion years ago, conditions on the early Earth were quite different than conditions today. There, were no, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. Okay? The composition of the atmosphere was much different. There was uh, much more energy, in, like lightning and so forth, on the Earth. And so conditions were quite different, and scientists um, believe that some of these harsh early earth conditions um, are where these is, uh, archaea uh, evolved. And some are still on the earth today living in these extreme conditions. Okay. So bacteria are a more common organism to us probably, and you're familiar with certain types of bacteria I know you've heard about. They also are in their own domain. And the Latin name of their kingdom is Monera, M-O-N-E-R-A, but we're just going to use the general term bacteria. And bacteria are unicellular. They're also prokaryotic. Many bacteria are heterotrophs, but some bacteria are autotrophs as well. 
and another factor. And, and so, you know, up to there, we may say, well, that sounds very similar to Archaea. And those are similarities, but they have differences as well that we didn't sort of enumerate. One, one of those is a cell wall. So what did we talk about type of organism that had a cell wall? Plant cells have a cell wall made of cellulose. Other kingdoms also have cell walls, but they're typically made of other material. Okay? Fungi have cell walls. Archaea have cell walls. Bacteria have cell walls. But each made of sort of different substances, and different structure. So they do have cell wall, but it's not the same type of cell wall that a plant has. And bacteria can reproduce in a way similar to archaea with binary fission, an asexual form of reproduction. Here we see some picture of some spherical bacteria. There's some rod-shaped bacteria. We'll look at this in a little more detail. Now. Bacteria are quite small. So we looked at single cells back when we were looking at microscopes. We looked at like cheek cells, plant cells, and they were pretty small. But bacteria are much, much smaller than even those, those single cells that we saw. If we look at this diagram and give us a sense of that, so when we looked at our microscopes, do you remember the field of view under um, low power? What was our, how much area could we see in low power? Uh, 40? No, 4. 4. About 4 millimeters, 4,000 micrometers. When we switch to medium power, it's about 1,500 micrometers. When we switch to our very highest power in our microscopes, it was about 500 micrometers we could see. So this is the head of a pin. Okay? The bacteria are on there. It's almost hard to see them in this one. These are all many, many bacteria. When we look at the highest magnification in this diagram, that's just 10, millim 10 micrometers here. So these bacteria are about 10 micrometers in depth, very tiny. If we're looking at them in our microscopes, they would be barely, barely visible to us, even under our highest power. So they're quite small, much, much smaller than eukaryotic cells. It sort of makes sense because eukaryotic cells have other larger organelles within them. They have a nucleus and nuclear membrane. Prokaryotic cells are relatively small. They're relatively simple. They don't have all of those organelles within them. In fact, scientists believe that mitochondria and chloroplasts were actually prokaryotic cells that had evolved the ability to um, make their own food through photosynthesis and then symbiotically entered into another type of cell that eventually became its own sort of living organism and that's where eukaryotic cells came from, a symbiosis between a couple different types of prokaryotic cells. That gets into more than we need to talk about but it's sort of interesting. All right, so if we think you don't have this slide, this is just to talk about. Um, you've heard of different types of bacteria before, and you've heard their names. Mostly why? Mostly related to what? To health. Because many types of bacteria are pathogenic. They cause disease. But not all. I ate this yogurt this morning. If I look on the bottom of this yogurt, it says this yogurt contains live and active cultures talking about bacteria. So there's live bacteria in yogurt. This, bac this yogurt has S. thermophilus, L. bulgaricus, L. acidophilus, bifidus, and L. kessel. So like five species of bacteria are found in this yogurt. They make yogurt. Okay. Um, so bacteria are categorized based on shape. Okay. Some bacteria are what we call rod-shaped. Okay, they're shaped sort of like a cylinder. Okay, and those bacteria are called bacillus. Others are spherical, like a ball. Those are um, coccus. Some are sort of spiral-shaped, okay, called spirillia. And then there's some prefixes we sometimes use. Strepto, 
Okay? Strepto means that the bacteria form chains, sort of linear chains. Staclo means they form clusters. And so that's where some of the names of these bacteria that we've heard of come from. Okay? This is Streptococcus bacteria. Series of spherical bacteria, that's the coccus. Strepto, meaning these chains. And this is what causes strep throat. If you have a strep throat infection, you have a bunch of these bacteria have for some reason colonized your throat. They're living on the tissue on the, in your throat. They're breaking it down, they're irritating it, and your throat hurts. And so you get strep throat. When they gag you with that giant Q-tip, they're taking a sample of um, tissue or a sample of cells from the tissue of your throat. They'll then test it and culture it and see if it's actually caused by this streptococcus bacteria. Because sometimes a sore throat could be caused by a virus. And an antibiotic won't be helpful in that case. It's only helpful if you have a bacterial infection. Staphylococcus. This is staphylococcus. This one. Come on. And staphylococcus uh, is another pathogenic bacteria. It causes skin infections, staph infections, which you may have heard about in sort of hospitals or sometimes in um, um, sports. Sometimes, like um, wrestling, um, there's sometimes a, a staph infection um, spread between um, athletes because they're in close proximity wrestling each other, so an infection can spread from person to person. That's why they like, I mean, wrestle, they spray down the mats and they're very careful about cleaning things and cleaning your equipment. It happens in other sports too if you're sharing equipment sometimes. E. coli bacteria, these are the rod shaped bacteria. Um, E. coli, many live in our digestive tract. Some types help us to digest certain nutrients. Others can cause um, food poisoning. These are cyanobacteria. These are some of the photosynthetic bacteria, the bacteria that can use sunlight to make their own food. So there's a wide variety of different types of bacteria. Um, we're not going to get into much detail about them. You can take whole courses in college about you know, microbiology and studying the various types of bacteria and stuff. Many bacteria are mobile and move using a flagellum, which we'll learn about in a minute. It's a tail, basically. Some have many flagellum that help them to move around. Okay, this is a cool video, but we don't have time to watch it, actually. It's about sort of the first life on Earth, and we'll get towards archaea and bacteria and so forth. But sometime, if we have a chance, maybe we could go back to it. All right, so let's move on to protists. This is where we're going to be spending most of our time. Okay. So protists. What domain are they in? Do you remember from last week, right? Bacteria. No, they're separate from bacteria. So bacteria are their own. Archaea are their own domain. And then the next, the rest of the four are in one domain. Eukarya? Eukarya. The domain is called eukarya. And it includes everything that is what? A eukaryote. The four kings are eukaryotic are protists, fungi, plants, and animals. So protists get their own kingdom, protista. And it's actually a uh, scientists that really study classification taxonomy don't really like the protist kingdom. <laughs> it's kind of a catch all kingdom. Whereas taxonomy was being studied and organisms, we started to learn more about organisms. They realized, well, the things we used to always put in protista, that kingdom, some of them are not really that closely related. And they may not have a direct ancestor in common. So it was kind of where they lumped things well that don't quite fit in anywhere else. And that, that's just what, we're, what we have. And um, so protists are, as we know, unicellular, eukaryotic, some autotrophs and some heterotrophs. And protists live in aquatic habitats. They live in the water. If you were to take some pond water in the springtime and, and take it, bring it here, look at it in the microscope, 
you'll find some protists in that water, some small single-celled organisms. There are also some protists that are parasitic. that live inside of other organisms and are parasites. Now you may have heard of like amoebic dysentery, right? causes a digestive illness caused by an amoeba in the digestive right? And these protists reproduce asexually through binary fission. You know what binary means? Two parts. Yeah, it means two parts, binary. Like uh, computers use a binary language, right? In computer language, everything's either what? One or zero. Right? One or zero. Um, you ever hear of a binary solar system? Oh, yeah. Where two solar systems combine? Not quite two solar systems. So oh, I know you're all familiar with A New Hope, right? Yeah. Tatooine, you know the Tatooine. Yeah. You know when Luke there and he's like. Just looking off into the sunset, yeah. the music is playing, right? And he's yeah. feeling very solemn, and he wants to get off of this desert planet and go do something bigger than himself and join the rebellion. Anyway, anyway what does the sunset look like? There's two, There's two sunsets. He lives in a binary solar system where the planets orbit two stars, and that's why he sees a double sunset, because it's a binary solar system. And music plays. And it is. It's a great part. What's that? It's like maybe one of my favorite scenes from Star Wars, that sunset scene. But it's so long. What, the sunset scene? Yeah. His car is like blowing in the wind and he's looking yeah, off and he's of like... <laughs> Do you know where that was filmed? Uh, that was filmed. Is there Harry oh, it's, it's not a Morocco, right? What's that? Morocco. Um, not quite. I know it was in, like it was was in Tunisia. Yeah. I believe it was in Tunisia. Nor that. Yeah, because there's nothing else that you can see. Yeah. Um, anyway, besides I got off on my Star Wars rant, but um, oh yeah, that binary means two. That's that, all that like the binary means two. So binary fission is splitting into two parts. It's a form of asexual reproduction. There's only one parent involved. So what are the offspring like? It's identical. Yeah, copies, identical copies. Can you just hear the song playing in your head? Of, no, I forget what the song is. Uh, so, in binary fission, you have a single cell. This is an amoeba. It has a nucleus in it. And if it's going to reproduce, the nucleus sort of makes a copy of itself. So we have one cell with two nuclei in it. And then the cytoplasm starts to divide splits in half, a nucleus goes in each side, and now I have two amoeba. It's reproduced. We went, had one, we end up with two. But they're copies, because this nucleus is just copied. These cells are basically copies. When we look at the protists and classify them, we put them in groups based on their movement. Okay. And so we have four sort of categories of these protists. Amoeboids, ciliates, flagellates, and sporozoans. And it's based on how they move. So the amoeboids, this is an amoeboid, they move using something called false feet. Pseudopods, false feet. If you have problems with your feet, what kind of doctor do you have? A podiatrist. That prefix or that root P O D means having to do with the feet. Pseudo means like fake. So it means false feet. And the pseudopods we'll talk about in a minute are these extensions of the cytoplasm. And the one we're going to look at is called an amoeboid. Amoeba. An amoeba is an amoeboid. Protein. Ciliates move using cilia. Does anyone know what a cilia is? What cilia are, I should say? See? Isn't it like little hairs? Little tiny hairs. Yep. And the example we will be studying is a paramecium.
Flagellates move using a flagellum, which is a, a whip-like tail. The one we will look at is called the euglena. And then the last type is called the sporozoan. Sporozoans are some parasitic protists that don't really move on their own. And I know there's a sporozoan you are all familiar with, even if you might not know it yet, it is a pathogenic, a disease-causing protist that you studied extensively from what people have been telling me last year. According to my students, they spent nine months and spent all of sixth grade studying this. Do you know what I'm going to say? What? Malaria. Malaria, and then you tie DDT into it. What? Oh, yeah, I remember Yeah, I remember that. So we are going to talk this week about malaria and about DDT for maybe 30 minutes. Okay. Nine, nine months. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but you guys are going to know every. You should know everything, right? Yeah, yeah. About malaria. Yeah. 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 All right. We'll see. Guys, we just said that's what we oh, yeah. So plasmodium is the name of the protist that causes the disease malaria. It's a protist. Malaria is a disease. Plasmodium is what causes. All right, so let's, let's talk about these uh, different groups. The amoeboids. The amoeboids move using pseudopods. And so all these little extensions of the cytoplasm, those are pseudopods. The amoeboids have a very flexible cell membrane, and their cytoplasm kind of streams forward. It oozes around, allowing them to move from place to place. They're kind of blob like, they just like blob forward and like drag themselves along. But they also use their pseudopods to ingest food. So let me show you this little tiny video clip here of this amoeba moving so you can get a, a better sense of what I'm talking about. So this is, whole thing is an amoeba. And you can see this is the cytoplasm inside of it. And it kind of just oozes forward. This is a, a pseudopod forming. And that's how this amoeba moves from place to place. It just kind of oozes forward. It's not as good as the Tatooine Sunset music. But. I'm going to show you guys that before we leave. All right. So the pseudopods are those, those extensions of the cytoplasm used for movement and ingestion. And so when oh, I have to switch this. Hold on one sec. And it gets messed up. Whenever I show a YouTube video on full screen presentation that's messed up. So if you look at this amoeba down here, you can see it has a nucleus in it. These are these are pseudopods. So if let's say there is some delicious amoeba food. I was gonna be a slice of pizza but now it's more of an ice cream. Yeah, anyway. Alright. So if this amoeba is going to consume its, this amoeba ice cream cone, what happens is basically these pseudopods will start to extend around it. Okay? And they'll ooze forward, gradually getting larger, until eventually they connect. And then where is this amoeba ice cream cone? Inside. It's now inside of it. Right? So the amoeba engulfed it. So what we would call this now this little bubble with an ice cream cone, now it's a food vacuole. And the amoeba will secrete some enzymes into this food vacuole to break down this ice cream cone, and then it can absorb nutrients from it. And that's how these amoeboids consume their food. They basically engulf it, it's then in a food vacuole, and then they can digest.
Now these protists that we're talking about, these freshwater protists, have a problem. What's a problem with a single-celled organism living in fresh water? Something we've talked about a couple months ago, I guess. Carter? Doesn't it expand? Yeah. When we have cells in fresh water, because of what process? Osmosis. Osmosis, diffusion of waters. Water will be constantly flowing into them, and they could swell up. And so they need a way of dealing with that. And what they generally have is this organelle called a contractile vacuole. It's basically like, I don't know, some of you probably have a sump pump in your basement at home. You know, anyone have that? When, if, if your basement starts to flood, the sump pump turns on, pumps water out of your house so your basement doesn't flood. Okay? That's what this contractile vacuole, as water flows into the protus, comes into this contractile vacuole and it pumps it out so that it can maintain its water balance. This is a pair, all of these images are of a paramecium. It's a cilia. Cilia moves by cilia. These tiny little hairs that are all along the outside of the protus. So the one we're gonna look at is a paramecium. Now you guys, you guys ever notice this on my door? So I'm in, in currently in development I have a new brand of sneakers. They're called Mesium brand sneakers. This is going to be the logo for them. They're <laughs> currently in the planning stages. And so then you can buy a pair of Mesium. Yeah. Uh, oh. so, so be on the lookout. These will be at you know the sneaker store probably any time now. Um, I'll let you know. You get the custom editions I'm making. But um, yeah, so that's the logo. So paramecium are protists, single-celled, obviously, with these cilia lining them. And they always have a distinctive shape. They're often called slipper shape, or they're shaped like a footprint. And they're shaped like this because they have a pellicle, a, a sort of hard shell around them that gives them that distinctive shape. But because it's like this hard shell, they can't engulf their food like an amoeba could. They don't have a flexible cell membrane that can change shape. So they have an organelle, it's kind of like a mouth. Not quite an organelle, but a structure like a mouth. It's called the oral groove. I'm forming a band, that's going to be the name, oral groove. I think that's a good band name. And the oral groove is like an indentation in the pellicle that has cilia in it that kind of usher in food by moving. They bring in tiny food particles into this oral groove. And then it leads into a sort of tube that goes into the paramecium. It's called the gullet. A tube that leads into the gullet. And at the end of the gullet is a food vacuole. So as they ingest food, it goes into the oral groove, through the gullet, into this food vacuole, where it can then be digested. But also because these paramecium have this hard shell, they can't remove waste as easily as something with just an outer cell membrane. So they have a part called the anal pore, which opens to the outside to remove waste from the paramecium. And that leads us to our last slide of the day. The flagellates. Flagellates move with a tail called a flagellum. And this flagellum sort of whips around and it pulls them forward through the water. The example we'll look at is called the euglena. Euglena are interesting because they are both autotrophs and heterotrophs. They have chloroplasts within them, so they can use sunlight to make food. But if there's no sunlight available, they can also consume food. So they can get energy in both ways. They're autotrophs and heterotrophs. And the euglena have a, a flagellum, their tail. They use for movement. They have chloroplasts in them, that's why they're green. So they can 
make their own fluid through photosynthesis. They also have near the flagellum a patch called the eye spot. Now, it's not an eye, they can't like see images, but it's a patch of cells, or a patch of this cell membrane sensitive to light so that they can sense where light is, so they can sort of move towards it to allow them to complete photosynthesis. All right, we're going to um, stop there for today.